Today's session uh, will be hosted by Ann Duncan, who is currently the CTO for state and local government at Dell Technologies. Uh, previously, Ann was the CIO for the County of Santa Clara, and before that, she was the CIO for the US EPA. Ann, please take it away. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. I'm really excited about our uh, event today. We got a great group of panelists, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves here in just a second. What I'm going to ask them to do is to tell me who they are, where they work, um, and a little bit about their expertise and interests and focus areas. Uh, so we're going to do that, and then we're going to move on to questions. So I want to start uh, with Mike Walsh from the Census Bureau. Hey, Ann, thank you so much, and uh, hello to everyone who's out there in our virtual world. Um, the, uh, my name is Mike Walsh. I, I work for the U.S. Census Bureau. I am the Agile Transformation Lead over there at the, at the U.S. Census Bureau. And for everyone who's already filled out their census, I thank you. Um, the, uh, you, are, you are part of us reaching over 50% uh, count as early as, as, as early as we've ever done. So thank you all for your efforts in helping us support our mission. Um, the, uh, the other part, I got to throw a little bit of thing in there. I do not represent uh, the U.S. Census Bureau and nothing I say on this phone can be considered as an official statement by the U.S. Census Bureau. And I say that just because sometimes I can get a little, uh, a little, a, a little down the road in terms of how I speak. Um, the, uh, my, uh, I have many certifications. Um, I'm, I'm less certified. I'm safe certified. I'm, I'm an SBC. I'm a I'm, I'm a scrum master. I have all these different certifications that I've been empowered to get through my organization. Um, and, uh, and so really where I work at is I'm more of a C-level coach uh, who's able to interact with our enterprise leadership. And I'm able to drop down into teams, into divisions, and into uh, portfolios in order to help them achieve agility across the organization. So happy to be here. And, and thanks again. Hey, thank you, Mike. So let's move on next to Che Ho from the County of Santa Clara. Hi, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks, Ann. Um, I'm Che. I work for the County of Santa Clara in their technical services and solutions uh, department. Um, my role there as an Agile coach and uh, Agile transformation lead is pretty new, uh, but I've been training and uh, uh, teams in Scrum and Kanban since 2007. Um, so I'm a Scrum certified professional as well as a Scrum at Scale uh, certified trainer. Uh, and I have a background in application development, healthcare, and emergency management. Um, and that's a little bit about me. Glad to be here. Thanks a lot for having this conversation. Great. Thank you. So let's move on to uh, Ron McKenzie from USDA. Great, thanks, Ann. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Ron McKenzie. I'm with the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, the Farm Production and Conservation Area, a uh, newly formed area by our Secretary Sonny Perdue uh, when he came on board. I've um, been a practicing Agile coach for about 10 years now, introduced Agile to the Federal Crop Insurance Program uh, to achieve better outcomes. More recently, I am certified in the Scaled Agile Framework and have been launching trains within the FPAC arena, as well as providing consulting out to other USDA areas. Um, and kind of like Mike, I can be at the team level. A lot of times I am, but I also uh, help executives understand this new way of working. You know, really just looking to better our outcomes to our customers, you know, as well as achieving that flow through what we all know in the federal world is a fairly antiquated process system. So just trying to find better ways to work. Great. Thanks, Ron. And finally, uh, Joanne Kelly, Joanna Kelly from Miami-Dade. Hi, good afternoon. Well, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to join everyone. My name is Joanna Kelly. I am an Agile coach for Miami-Dade County. Um, I've been with the county now for about almost three years. Um, I was brought in um, by our executive leadership to help with their transformation. Um, like Ron and Mike, I also work uh, with the executive leadership committee, as well as with teams uh, throughout our department at ITD, which is information technology, as well as with our customers um, throughout the county. So um, I'm glad to be a part of this panel and excited to get started. Thank you, Anne. Great. Thanks, Joanna. All right, well, let's move into our first question. Um, so uh, two, it's sort of a couple parts to this question, and we'll let you guys run with it. Um, what does Agile transformation in the public sector mean to you? Are there special challenges of being an Agile coach in the public sector? And if so, uh, what do you do to ensure you can be effective at coaching in the public sector? And I'm going to throw this out, uh, but ask Ron to start and then we'll go from there. 
Yeah, you know, it's a really good question, Anne. Um, to me, what, what that transformation means is really about, you know, moving from outputs to moving to outcomes. You know, um, the government's very focused on the big upfront documents, the big waterfall approach, that certainty. And really it's about trying to determine, again, what those outcomes are, testing those as hypotheses, right, and building software. You know, trying to avoid, you know, the big upfronts that we've seen in our governments. So, and, and that, that really involves changing the mindset, you know, getting leadership to understand that, hey, you know what, 65% of the time, these things are, are over budget, uh, above schedule. Let's adapt to a new way, you know, and, and really also bringing the principles into play, right? Um, the government's very heavy process focused, but really focusing on the principles, because we can put in all kinds of, of tricks and, and practices, but we may not achieve again back to those outcomes. Uh, to your second part about challenges of being a coach in the, in the, 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 the public sector, you know, I, I think it goes back to something that uh, Mark Swartz said, you know, in one of his recent books about the, the contractor control paradigm, you know, and I, I think that, you know, the bigger challenge for, for us coaches is, you know, the government's used to having vendors, you know, say and, and, and recommend practices, but having that internally is a little different. So you get a little bit of a reaction to that, um, but but I think you it also is an opportunity to build trust, you know, to realize that hey, this is a partnership working to to achieve what I call a badgeless environment, working together, um, you know, and I, and I think that that challenge is 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 largely centered around people just don't know really what agile is. They have an idea, they think it's all about you know going really fast. We all know that's not the case. You know, and I think it's also, you know, really about helping them understand the value that you can bring. Um, you know, and I think the way to be effective around doing that is adopting an, an OKR approach, objectives and key results and to your performance and what you do. You know, having folks kind of understand that you can't make the transformation happy, happen, but you can really do things to affect that change, uh, you know, and, and it, it's measurable. You know, we definitely like to measure things in the government. So, um, you know, taking that OKR approach in your, you know, in your, your performance plan, you know, really helps. I think to close, the big thing is, you know, if you want to be effective is have fear and do it anyway. Um, you know, there's a lot of command and control in government. It's just, it's in its nature, you know, but I think having fear and being transparent and being professional uh, when you challenge, you know, a way an executive may be behaving, behaving or a product owner, you know, or a scrum master, um, be open and, and have those conversations. You know, the key is not to judge. We don't judge as coaches. I think all my fellow panelists will agree, you know, but, but help them see a different way and, and help build the bridge. Um, you know, I have found to be the most effective way to, to gain, to gain support. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Joanne, you want to jump in next? Yes, I do. Um, a lot of my similar notes, I think, are with Ron. Um, for us, I think a lot of it, um, as Ron touched on, was moving kind of from this structured way of doing things um, and kind of getting out of our comfort zone a little bit and, and trying to react better. Um, when I spoke with one of our um, executives earlier to kind of prep for this call a little bit and get some more history from them, uh, she reached out and said, you know, our vendors were doing this. Um, we needed to catch up. We were behind. And so um, for her and the, the organization, it's, you know, it was kind of time, past time maybe, but um, they wanted to say, you know, we are a service. And if we don't start, you know, moving forward, we're going to be left behind as an organization even though we're a government entity um you know we are an it group that is here to provide solutions and um and it was also i think the other biggest point for our um our executives was to have more collaboration with our external customers um you know we work with all of the departments throughout the county we develop software applications for everyone from police to communications to our website for miamidade.gov all of that is developed by our teams and you know 
it used to be that you know a, a request was handed in and put in a pile and the team did everything and six months later or a year later or five years later in some cases the the uh, customer got it back and we want them to get results faster so that was part of the reason we collaborated with them we wanted them to you know own what they what they ask for and and work with us to build what truly brings them value and um so that was it as far as the challenges i think they're fairly similar across the board um i was brought in externally um, because internally they did not have anyone uh, now that I am internal, I, I struggle with some of the same issues sometimes. It's, well, yeah, that sounds great, but we've done this for decades. So that's life and the Scrum sounds fun. Um, and we primarily, I, I forgot to mention that in my intro, we use Scrum um, for primarily for most of our agile work. Um, we do have some teams that use Kanban and other tools, but when I came to the county, um, we did have several people that already had Scrum Master certifications. I have a Scrum Master certification, and that's primarily what my background is and what I've used in past um, organizations. So we've kind of rolled with that since that's the most familiar to people. Um, but, you know, going forward, we just really, for us, I think it's more, you know, to kind of let go of some of this fear we have for trying things that are new and um, to be able to get work of value done a little bit faster for our customers so we're not left behind and you know they pick other options great thank you joanna um mike you want to jump in now that's awesome i so i echo what everyone else has, has already said um i you know being being an agile coach in the public sector is a you know, at a large organization such as such as Census, we get these silos that are set up, right? And these silos are really, you know, from the way that our HR structures are broken down, where you have these divisions and you have these directorates, and then you have these branches, and then you have these sections. And uh, and everyone in this work to become agile, right? Each one of these sections can become agile in and of themselves, and each one of these divisions could become agile, right? And they all sit there and start adopting their own practices. And what happens is as soon as everyone starts moving at a quicker pace, right, we start to have this uh, chaos that comes in through because, um, you know, we, we were talking before the call about, you know, agile procurement, right? And, uh, you know, and, and the way that, you know, we worked with our procurement teams is to see them as a service delivery and not as a development shop, right? And so uh, how do you track your service delivery and how do you better deliver that service? And so um, I think, you know, what I have to, think about in about where I sit in an organization is that I have to be flexible enough with the principles right to align to different service deliveries and also to align all those services to come together to one to enable the value flow and and, and it can get tricky because you have these power structures right that are set up based on directors and, and leaderships and and really where you know the trick comes in is how can I prove or how can I enable right um, to to the leadership that that, that I'm trustworthy, that I'm honest, and that I'm trying to help them, right? And, uh, you know, and this gets into the idea of becoming agile, right? Um, you know, we're always in an eternal state of becoming. And a lot of our leaders want to be like, I, when do we get to done, right? And so we have these great definitions of done on our efforts and, and of our user stories and of our deliveries, right? We, we can get to done. But as far as the transformation goes, done doesn't really exist, right? It's about becoming, right? And it's about continual evolution. And I think that that's probably where as a federal coach um, and rather than a contract coach is where I have my greatest impact. I get to keep that horizon shift going at, at the enterprise level where those, where those, where those, you know, contractor coaches are coming in and have such a small focus on their effort. Right. And it's not that it's a small focus. There's some very big efforts that are going in. Um, but how do we continue to set that horizon for leadership in order to be able to keep becoming agile and to keep, you know, extending our arm into the groups that need it or want it. Um, and so, you know, I hope I answered the question. Um, and, and I hope, and, but anyways, and I'll pass it on. You can get to the next one. All right, well, last but not least on this one, Shay, what do you think? Thanks, yeah, great comments. Joanne, I, I, I had to comment about, you said something about, uh, you know, oh, Scrum, it sounds fun, let's do this. 
I don't think I've ever actually had that <laughs> conversation before. <laughs> it's usually it's usually something like, oh, do we really want? Nah, maybe not. <laughs> oh, yeah, they, they tried at least once. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the question about agile transformation in the public sector for me, um, it really starts with, you know, why? Uh, why do we want to change? Why do we need to change, um, honestly? Um, because I guess I'll flip the order of the question slightly because one of the biggest challenges I think uh, that I've encountered, not in, uh, you know, just government, but also in healthcare, uh, is they don't. The, the general thought is we don't have competition. So who are we trying to race against? Why do we have to do things faster? And I think that when we really examine that, uh, you know, that question of why do we need to change, it actually comes from our community. Their, their habits, their expectations, it's growing and growing and growing. Um, you know, they're expecting answers in days rather than weeks. Um, they're expecting to have a larger voice, uh, you know, in the processes, in the uh, in the formation of what government and what services will look like in the future. So this is where I think that leaving the old world of the industrial revolution, Taylorism, uh, top-down sort of thing, and moving more towards the collaborative uh, solutions uh, that the agile mindset brings. Um, that's really what uh, an agile transformation in public sector uh, means for me. Excellent. Thank you so much for all of you for that. Um, so our second question uh, is, why did you become an agile coach and why did your organization embark on an agile transformation? And I'm going to ask Joanna to start us off on this question. Okay. Um... Wow, I became an Agile coach. Um, I have been doing Scrum and um, leading some teams uh, and was a developer in my past life uh, for a while. And I, won, I, was, I had just finished an opportunity and I was looking and I saw a posting for an Agile coach for Miami-Dade County. And I said, that sounds interesting. Let's see what that's about. And I interviewed. Um, so, uh, it was a chance to take kind of my team skills to the next level um, and, and work within an organization at ground zero. I mean, they, when I joined uh, three years ago, um, they had maybe two or three teams that were doing agile. Um, they had scrum, they were doing standups, uh, they were using boards and, and, and working in that manner. And the rest, as Jay had mentioned, and I think that was a fantastic point, um, was strictly old school. And we, we have this hierarchy. And I think that's another huge challenge that we have is there's so many divisions. There's, in, in just our department alone, we have 13 or 14 divisions. We have within those divisions, we have X amount of managers. Within those managers, we have X amount of teams. Everybody is very regimented. And that is built in. Um, we do have competition um, from external vendors and with our, our services. So um, for us, there is competition there. But another challenge, which I forgot to mention, was that um, there's not a lot of incentive to do this, right? Because everything worked just fine before you came here. So why do I need to do this again? And it kind of builds on, I think, Che's thing. You know, we do this. We have this process in place. Why do I need to go do a stand-up? And so, yes, people do try it because it's new. Um, we do have a workshop that teaches people what Scrum is, what Agile is, because we have people in our office that have zero idea what it is. So I do a two-day workshop. We kind of go over the basics. We ask them to try it, to experiment. Um, so they do. Um, but our, I think our biggest issue is having them stay with it. Because um, then they say, well, we don't need a stand-up. I don't, I don't need to know what so-and-so is doing tomorrow. I don't care. So coming in, I think it was wonderful. And it is wonderful because I think Mike mentioned this, that you get to keep working with them as they move forward, right? So from two teams, now I have 20 teams. Now we're not only doing, you know, 
our stories and things like that. Now we're looking how we're going to ma manage our work across our organization. How are we going to stand, put these standards and how are we going to work this way together and collaborate together and move from these silos that we have across these 13 divisions to be able to share code, you know, so we don't have redundancy. So um, that for us, you know, that's why I joined. Um, and I, I kind of mentioned some of the reasons why they started this transformation in the past. Um, you know, like I said, our vendors were doing this, you know, all of a sudden we had developers on standups with the vendors and they were like, what's this? What are we supposed to be doing? So the industry was changing whether we changed with it or not. And so that's kind of where we are. So we might have been a little slow to the game, but we're, we're trying to catch up and, and, and work with that. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, Mike, uh, what's your story here? Man, I, the dreaded question of why, right? Um, you got to know your why, as Simon says. And, and, and I got to tell you, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I know my why, but I'll give you about how I got here, right? Um, I would love to tell you it was a dream and that I was just inspired to be an Agile coach. Um, and somehow I manifested this opportunity to have the best <laughs> job in the world. I, it's just not true, right? Um, um, I, uh, I've made my career uh, running into burning buildings that other people are running out of. And, and, uh, and what that means is uh, back in uh, 2014, um, uh, when OPM had a breach, I went running into a building um, and where a lot of people were leaving. And, uh, and post-breach, OPM was a very hectic place and we had 13 individual systems and I got given a project very early, which was about identity and access management. And uh, without a doubt, that had to go very, very quickly. And so I established my team, we got up and running with Scrum. And uh, we were highly productive in and of ourselves, but we couldn't get anything off our plates because nobody could accept the amount of work that we had, not our change management policies, not our SDLC, not our testing. Nobody could keep up with the rate of speed in which we were producing things. And so what happened is I had my first scaling issue where I had to adopt and I had to create this coalition of the willing of people to be able to work with me. Now, the driver wasn't my like impeccable leader or anything else like that. There's obviously a burning system at hand and I had that to empower a lot of the changes. Um, but what happened is we were able to get this project done. We were able to get a new identity and access management and secure the systems. But what happened at OPM is I was given an opportunity to, uh, to stand up an agile center of excellence. And in that agile center of excellence, I was able to take all 13 systems and align them to a single practice. And that was my first effort with SAFE. And when I launched my first set of SAFE trains, and, you know, and the big victory there is, um, you know, at the end of the Obama administration, he had one big agenda with the National Background Investigation Bureau, and that was to redefine the psychology question, right? Have you ever sought, uh, you know, psych psychological help? Um, and so to decriminalize it is the way Obama said. And so we originally scoped this as about two and a half years of project time in order to be able to deliver this question to the public, question to the public. And we were able to stand up an agile release train and be able to deliver this across 13 systems and get it out to the public in 13 months. And, uh, and, and, and that's a pretty cool thing. I got to meet President Obama because of my efforts in there. And, and all that stuff is cool. Um, and what happens is I you know, some of the people that I worked with at OPM had moved on to census and they said, hey, we had this agile transformation effort. Would you come over here and do what you did? And, and so when I came over, right, it's a bigger opportunity. It's, you know, you have the decennial census and you have all these five different directorates that are delivering value. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the census have a burning platform issue? Well, certainly on lower levels, but you guys certainly don't see them to, to that degree. Um, and so, you know, our current, uh, our current why is that we're trying to move to the future, right, of data, right? And so we're, you know, federal, federal systems get caught in this legacy, right? And what we're trying to do is make our new legacy. And, and by doing that, you know, enabling the agile practices, the agile teams, and how do we have data flow across the spectrums instead of be siloed? And, you know, to a lot of that, um, to anyone who you know, absorbs the, uh, the census data. You know, we rolled out a new platform last year. There's going to be new, new data coming to it. And our, hope, our, our, our hopeful outcome is that there'll be one location with all the shared data that census can provide to be able to citizens. And that's a real focus on value that census has been true to. And so to that, right, I'm very lucky to be where I'm at and working on the transitions I'm in. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, Mike. And, you know, I'll say that I, I understand the, the habit of running into burning buildings. And, you know, it's one I've been trying to break as well. I seem to not be very good at it. 
Um, and thank you for the work at the OPM. I, I, looking through the attendee list, there's a whole bunch of people I know who, who, who were part of that data breach, <laughs> for better or for worse, um, mostly worse. So anyway, um, let's go on to Che and hear what Che has to say on this topic. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, I, I love the analogy of the uh, the burning building thing. Uh, I actually uh, worked as a paramedic uh, for a while, so I actually did help uh, run into burning, literal burning buildings. Uh, it, so it's it it is an interesting sort actually. Uh, people who want to run into the burning building, so I totally relate to that. Um, so I actually started. Uh, I adopted Scrum back in two thousand seven out of sheer necessity. Um, I was a team lead, I was an application developer, uh, and I was going, I was gonna say slowly insane, but no, quickly insane. Uh, you know, with, with getting pulled with all these, you know, different demands coming in uh, and just not being able to uh, keep up. You know, we had uh, six different managers coming to us saying that, you know, it's like, oh, this is the highest priority. We have to do this now, we have to do this now, we have to do this now. So, um, so that's where I attended uh, um, a talk uh, on uh, Scrum specifically. Uh, and I went, huh, that sounds like a really great idea. So without asking permission, I just started running my team uh, uh, in Scrum. And we started outpacing uh, the, uh, the requests. We would get the request in and we would actually output, uh, we would deliver uh, a, a a product to them, and um, the stakeholders actually would look at us askance and say, "We didn't expect you to deliver this so quickly." So you know that that kind of made gave me the uh, you know the, the real experience of huh, this stuff works. Um, so I moved on to another team. I trained in the same way. I moved on to another team uh, and trained in the same way. Um, so yeah, it was it's actually a great feeling. Uh, for when you can look at the stakeholders and say it, and actually deliver into their hands something more than they asked for. Um, I have a saying in my teams that um, what we're aiming for is to delight the customer, not simply meet to their expectation. You know, we want to delight them. Uh, so that became the bar, uh, you know, for the teams, and that started growing my passion uh, to, uh, to really get more teams uh, to operate this way. Um, because the other, the other saying that I have with all my teams is that if we're not having fun, we're doing it wrong. Uh, so uh, it, I, I became really the, the, the cheerleader and the, uh, the banner holder uh, of that. Fast forward to uh, why uh, Santa Clara County embarked on a full on Agile transformation, um, thanks in large part to Ann Duncan. Uh, it was actually, I, I think it was a very, a fairly unique time uh, that we had these major shifts in the executive leaderships and coming to uh, uh, the county uh, as well as uh, Imre Kabai. Um, they were, uh, it was refreshing to get those two levels of executives um, to say, we don't want business as usual. We want to shake things up. We want to change. Uh, and I think that, you know, um, that's really the key point. Uh, we can do grassroots uh, team changes fairly easily in any industry and in government. Um, but really when it comes to uh, a full transformation of not just one department, but maybe even an entire county, entire state, it really requires executive buy-in uh, because they're the ones that uh, you know really empowered me, uh, and they uh, Anne and Imre were the ones who actually created the uh, Scrum Master Code and the Agile Coach position uh, for me to really take this on uh, full time. Uh, so it co goes hand in hand. Um, you know, grassroots movement meets executive buy-in, and that's where a lot of the magic happens. Excellent. So, Ron, what's uh, what's the story for you? Two reasons. One, I love to help people. Uh, the second is I love to learn. You know, and, and like a lot of us, right? I, I think we've all gotten into this basically with battle scars. 
you know, I was hired by a CIO and brought me in to be a development manager and said, we want to be agile. And I remember saying to myself, great, what's that? Um, and just dug in, you know, dug into Deming's work, dug into Taiichi Ono and to Toyota Production System and really discovered where this stuff came from. And it just made sense. And, and actually, I found out in my life, I'd been practicing some of that and didn't even realize what it was. You know, taking iterative approaches with my children, trying to find, find a better way to be a parent, right? Just like I'm on a continual search to, to find ways to be a better coach, right? To help others and, and really see that light bulb go off. I mean, there is an amount of money you could give me that would replace the satisfaction of, you know, watching somebody, whether I'm in a class or if I'm coaching a team and that light bulb goes off and they run with it. Um, don't need any credit for that. I, I just earned my paycheck for sure, you know, and, and the learning, you know, that continuous learning. It's it, it, the practices constantly change, you know, understanding the principles, applying them to organizations. It's it's every day is something new. It's not the same monotony that you may see in a lot of jobs. And it's it has created a passion in me that's just contagious and, and I bleed everywhere. Uh, you know, I, I love what I do. And it, I think back to something my grandmother said to me about, you know, you never work a day in your life if you love what you do. You know, and, and I, I sense and feel that a lot because to everybody else, you know, for whatever reason, I've, I've never, thank you, Che, for jumping into burning buildings. I've never done it, but this stuff is hard. Uh, a fellow at Scale Agile, you know, said to me that this would be the most difficult thing you do, yet the most rewarding. And that statement was was spot on. You know, and I think we all, as coaches, really do love what we do, and and it's not easy. You know, and I think I think that challenge kind of keeps us going. You know, every day, and then constantly learning. I mean, I you know, there is no standard approach I use to anything. I, I have to understand the situation and and figure out the best approach for it, um, you know, and that's, uh, it, ma it makes it makes life and, and work interesting for sure. Great, thank you, Ron. Thank you all for being, for, for going into burning buildings, some literally, some figuratively, um, and uh, for your dedication. We'll do one more prepared question, then we'll go to the audience, I think. Um, so why did you become an Agile coach and why did your organization embark on an Agile transformation? And Mike, could you start this one off? So I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm yeah, sorry. I thought you were trying to be agile here. Yeah, no, I'm, I got distracted because my cat <laughs> arrived. You can't see him, but he was about to walk in front of the camera. Let's try that again. <clears throat> we all know that agile coaches are important to transformation efforts, but they are pretty rare and gone. Why do you think that is? And what can we do to change it? And now, Mike, would you please start us off on yeah, that? I'll certainly. Out of Thanks. Here. So I... I think the federal agile coach is pretty rare, right? Um, and, and, and I'll get into that in a second. I, I do know that we have plenty of agilists that are employed, at least through the Census Bureau, that are employed through contracts. It's just that their scope through statements of work and through impact, right? They can't really scope out, right? And so, um, you know, you know, so like as an as an agile coach to an organization, I have a couple different responsibilities and I can also have trust that these other agile coaches that I interact with are around um, integrating and doing the best they can. And so one of the biggest issues that, that we come up with is that based on contracts, there are certain people who that if I want to meet with them, I'm outside of their statement of work and they can't meet with me. And so, right, when you have this scaling issue as big as it is, and so we have an econ agile coach and we have a demo agile coach and we have these different things that are in our different divisions. And so what I try to do is create the, the coalition of the willing and where I can sit down and meet, meet with these people, find out what it is that I can help bring to their level. Um, and so they're always asking if certain things can be changed and if I can be able to promote. And so at Census, we have a center, uh, we have a lab called the CAT Lab, right? Center for Applied Technology. And, and it's an air gap system and where we can go and innovate and we can get teams doing proof of concepts and we can lead that. And so that's one area where I'm always invested in and in trying to be able to create teams and get those proof of concepts and those technology drivers going through the CAT Lab. The other thing is I'm trying to find those hot 
hotspots that are teams, uh, you know, our centers of excellence, our centers of enthusiasm, um, and trying to find those teams and trying to find out what it is they need. You know, I, I was uh, looking at the call list here, and I see that there's one friend I have from Census who's on the call, and, uh, and he was desperately trying to get something done, and I was able to reach down and be able to escalate those issues in order to make sure that our, you know, that, that, that our champions are being able to get the throughput that they need to be able to have their successes. Um, you know, another key result, uh, you know, that I really try to drive at a federal level is really, you know, assisting the organization to learn and grow together and not as separate units. You know, if exploration and creativity is matured across the enterprise, the outcomes can be continuous exploration, continuous learning. And, you know, then we really have that foundation of agility and innovation. And so once again, like where, where does my role fit into that becoming agile? And it's just not enough to do agile. And I think that when you get the right people with the right authority, right, then we can start to to, to use the matrix of agile coaches and agility throughout the system to deliver that continuous learning culture. Thanks, Mike. Um, so Che, what, what do you think? How can we make this, how can we get more agile coaches out there? Yeah, um, yeah, really darn good question. Um, and I think that for me, um, you know, the question of why is it, why is agile coaches still a rare breed uh, you know, in government as well as elsewhere, really. Um, and I think it starts with the misconception um, that Agile is a destination rather than a culture. Um, and the analogy that, that I like using is uh, in, like in sports, right? Um, you, you don't need, if you're just going from point A to point B, you don't necessarily need a coach. You just kind of like bumble your way through uh, and it's fine. But if you really want to get good at something, you're going to need a coach. Uh, and that's really what I think that um, you know, sets the difference when, when a company uh, or a department or a team uh, you know, gets to this point of saying, you know, oh, we, we need a little help. Um, that also brings up the question that you know, Mike, Ron, and uh, Joanna uh, uh, spoke brilliantly about. Uh, really is the difference, you know, oh, so do we contract out for this, you know, or do we hire, you know, a, a position for this? And I think that, you know, all, it, everything that, uh, you know, it, they all brought up, I think is really, really good point about um, the contractor can come in and kind of inject a, re, you know, a, a, a path, you know, g give them a, a little bit of adrenaline, going back to my medical days, uh, and, uh, you know, give them a shot and, and, and keep them going. But it's the sustaining of that momentum that is uh, really, really difficult. Um, and honestly, I think that more and more uh, departments are starting to realize that in order to sustain this change, right, it's not a destination, it's a, it's a, it's a culture change. In order to sustain that, we're going to need somebody focused on that in-house. Great, thank you. Ron, what do you think? You know, I spot on, Jay. I mean, and to build off something you said earlier, you know, with regards to kind of Taylorism, right? I mean, the government is still rooted in a lot of these industrial revolution practices, um, you know, and, and, I, and what I see a lot of is, you know, it's the, oh, that's what Agile is? Oh, that's not what I thought, you know, and I think it gets down to the commitment, right, of the journey that it takes. Agile is something you, you, you become, you know, it's not something you do. And, and I think it's just a function of more and more successes uh, that need to happen so that folks realize that, oh, yeah, I want to sustain this journey. I want to keep it going because it is. It's a journey with no real destination. Um, and actually, there is a destination. We just haven't discovered it yet because we're constantly learning and adapting and, and following our principles, you know? And, and I think that, that that makes people inside a little strange. I mean, I've, I have to admit, I've had executives I've had to work with that, um, you know, sometimes don't necessarily want to hear some of the things I, I try to raise um, because that's not the way they've done it. And they've, they've gotten to a certain level in their organization by doing it a certain way. No fault to them. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it's different. And I think because it's different, folks question the value. They question, what am I really getting from this? And, and, and I think also too, when we bring in our vendor partners to help coach, right? There's, there's a, a beginning and end to that, right? There's a contract. Whereas now, if they're making that commitment, there's some fear there. 
um, you know, fear that, that maybe we don't want to do this or maybe, maybe we do and we don't know. So there's reluctance of, of, about, you know, reluctance to bring somebody in full time and actually be part of the organization. And, and what I have found comfort in knowing too is this happens in large private companies as well. This is not just a governmental issue, right? It's the large, it's basically a theory of large firms. You know, the larger the firm, the more bureaucracy, you know, other processes that have been around for a long period of time. It's no different than what we see in industry today with, with you know, how companies, local businesses are adapting. I was talking to a fellow coach yesterday and really love this, this concept of how the small businesses are really adapting to what's happening in our world today. And it's, as an agilist, it's, uh, it's fun and enlightening and heartwarming to see that, you know, and, and I think, again, it's right. It's how committed are they to this? It's new to them. Um, and the government has always had fear, you know, and, and I know for me personally, um, how I became an agile coach was I carved out my own space. I had a leader that provided support and, and I just went and ran with it. Right. I think back to, I think Jay, you mentioned this, right. Didn't ask for permission you know, just started practicing, started to do it. And then I built a customer base who now says, wow, what Ron does is really valuable. It's really helped us. And that, that starts the ball rolling to say, yeah, you know what, we need more of this. Great, thanks Ron. Joanna, what would you like to add to, to this? Oh, well, um, Ron took one of my answers. So thank you, Ron. Um, <laughs> so I think it's very hard to, um, I, I, I think it's, to back up, yes, we are a rare breed. Um, Tim Nolan actually introduced me to your group and brought me in, so I thank him for it. And he said, I think you're the only county agile coach I know of in the whole country. So thanks, Che, apparently I'm not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we are super rare. Um, and I think it goes back to a little bit of what both, everyone said, really. Um, you know, a lot of times we bring in a vendor and we'll say, make us agile, and they will do that. Um, I think in our case, they were fearful and there's still that fear there, but they wanted that person to stay and become part of the organization and help the organization because it's not a one-time thing. It's, you know, we, I teach in my class that agile is not a noun, it's an adjective, right? You have to be agile. We don't do it. So um, we need to figure out what part of speech it is first before we move forward with the organization. Um, and as far as showing value, you know, a lot of these metrics, and I think this kind of follows into the second part or the last question that you had, they're hard to measure, right? Um, but one way I think we show value is it's going to take time. It's not going to be instantaneous. Uh-oh that now have adopted teams and they've adopted all kinds of fun stuff. Um, and they've actually come to our executives from other departments and said, hey, we're using Azure DevOps now and we're gonna put all of our work here and we have boards and we're using Power BI to do this and this has cut our time in half and this is fantastic and this is how we work now. And so I think as we continue to have success, um, our, our way of, you know, Sometimes we kind of go back and forth with the carrot and the stick. And in our way, it's kind of like we need good marketing. And for me, when we have successful customers, when we have happy customers, we share that with people and people see the value. So it's, I think it keeps growing with us. Right. Well, speaking of Tim Nolan, uh, we have a question from Tim for <laughs> <Hi>, Joanna. Tim. <laughs> um, so Joanna, how does your public experience compare to the private sector? Well, I think all of us have come from private sector um well at some uh, maybe some sooner rather than later but um it's it was an adjustment period i'll, I'll say that because i'm being recorded and my potential fellow employees will watch this later but um it's you know um one of the things we talked about is how slowly sometimes things move so that was the biggest adjustment for me i was used to working in the private sector. And if I needed a pen, I went into the supply cabinet and got a pen. And here I was like, I had to fill out EPSRs and forms. And 
it took me a month of emails once to just get a pack of markers for one of my retrospectives for my teens. And I was like, I can just go buy them at Office Depot. It's cool. And they're like, no, 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 I'm sorry, you can't. So that was a huge adjustment. And, and the other biggest adjustment for me, um, to be frank, is um, in, the, in the private sector, there's a lot of incentives and there's also consequences. And in the public sector, there are very few consequences for employees that are unionized and tenured and don't want to do something you want to do. Um, and there's also no incentive sometimes for them to do it. I mean, they just got a project done a year ahead of schedule and saved the county $5 million. Thanks. You know, maybe we'll get you a small reward. But so sometimes it's hard to keep that enthusiasm going. So those are the two biggest challenges. But now I've, you know, it's been a couple of years, so I'm, I'm, I'm much better now, Tim, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you really have to be very intrinsically motivated to, to be successful in the, in the government. Um, so another question from Tim, this one's for Che. Um, have you found agile adoption varies with different departments and divisions? Have I found agile adoption varies? Yeah, agile adoption varying, meaning maybe the enthusiasm the desire to uh, to adopt Agile, maybe? Tim, go um, ahead. Yeah, he says yes. Yes, OK, OK, cool. Hey, hi, Tim. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yes, actually. Uh, so um, yes, uh, Agile adoption rates vary tremendously from department to department. And the commonality that I personally have found is um, how many times they've run up against the wall of trying to do the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. And, uh, and then somebody, uh, you know, in a position like a team lead or whatever, uh, hears about uh, Agile. Uh, and usually it's Scrum, uh, you know, because that's like what 70, 75% uh, of the Agile uh, adoptions out there. Um, and they, they look for more information. Um, kind of incidentally, oddly, is that some of the biggest resistances, um, not just myself, but a lot of my uh, uh, Scrum colleagues out there, a lot of the resistances come from the IT department, ironically enough. It seems like um, places like HR, um, you know, PMO, uh, project management, uh, or, and even uh, procurement, um, you know, they're starting to, uh, you know, put those feelers out uh, to say, uh, you know, it's like, huh, we're hearing all these successes of this agile thing in other industries. How can we adopt that here? So that conversation uh, is, is starting to, to gain some momentum. Um, hope that answered your question. Great. So the, the, the next question uh, was asked and answered, apparently. So Joyce Hunter, hi, Joyce, had asked, uh, how we develop a coalition that willing. She said, Mike already answered that. Mike, do you want to elaborate at all on developing, uh, creating coalitions that are willing? Or are you good with your comments? Well, I, I, I think I'll, I'll try to, to, to re-put it in there. I, I think the coalition of the willing is that uh, in all these organizations, we have these, uh, you know, these centers of excellence and these centers of enthusiasm that are boiling up from the bottom. Right. And what we got to do is just make sure that we uh, that, that we really provide them the cross functional ways. Right. Centers of excellence laces. If you're in the safe method. Right. These, these places where they can share learning, share experiences and, and share those things with each other. And then at census, the you know, Center for Applied Technology is another place and where you just get these coalitions built. And that as they start to create the wave, right, the, the unwilling get a chance to ride the wave, right? And, uh, and so it's either you're either going to be a part of us or you're going to be overtaken by us if we get enough, if we get enough support. So anyways, thank you. Yeah, thank, oops, did we just, oh, there's Mike. Okay, for a second, I thought we lost him. Um, and then uh, Sukumar had asked a question, which he said was also answered, but I'm going to throw it out there in case anyone wants to add. So um, Sukumar asked if Agile coaches are on the increase among state and local governments. And he said, Che and Mike both answered that. But does anyone else have any comments on the trends of, uh, of the use of Agile coaches? Or are we good? We're good. OK. All right. So the I'm next question. Make a I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted ahead, to make Jay. a quick comment on that. Um, it, I think that you know, really the, the, the main thing is that uh, the, the, the tipping point that we're experiencing right now 
is that nobody is asking if Agile works any longer. Um, you know, we have more than 30 years uh, of, of studies and teams uh, adopting and succeeding. And, and I think that that's actually the tipping point that, uh, you know, we're experiencing right now. And that's why more and more Agile uh, uh, jobs are showing up, more and more uh, desire to uh, look at coaching is showing up. So just wanted to kind of add that in there. Hey, great. We had a bunch of questions and we're not going to get to all of them. I'm sitting here trying to uh, uh, pick. I'm going to jump in with one because I think it's one that's a real challenge for people. Um, Joe asks, do you see procurement practices changing to support Agile? And well, who would like to start with that question? Ron, go ahead. I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah, because I have real good experience. You know? and, and the answer, the answer is yes. So, you know, we have, we have uh, organizations like USDS, US Digital Services Team, that's really embracing agile acquisitions. Um, and there are um, contracting offers out there, officers out there who are willing to take, you know, an, a, a basically a very collaborative approach to writing a statement of objectives, right? We're not writing requirements. What are we, what's the outcomes we're looking for for this? You know, we're doing prototypes, having a lot of, you know, due diligence, back and forth questions collaborating on writing a performance or work statement with our vendor partners who, who wins the award, um, trying to get all the assumptions off the table, you know, working very closely. So I, I think with the great work of USDS, um, we've got a great um, a CO within USDA as well. Um, I'll give him a shout out, Jason Catman, who's really, you know, embracing these practices. You know, it's different. Um, but, you know, I, I think you get better outcomes out of it. We can arrive from market research to award in maybe 60 days, maybe less than that, 90 days. Um, I just did an acquisition and helped with um, objectives for bringing in, bringing in agile coaches and scrum masters for a train I recently launched. Um, I think we did that in less than 30 days. I think it was actually maybe closer to 20, uh, you know, and a critical need when, you know, I, me as a coach by myself trying to launch this. So it, it's there. Um, and there's a lot of hacking that's happening, even within the private sector as well. So um, I, I see the change happening. Thanks, Ron. That's great. Anyone want to add anything to that before I move on to the next question? Yeah, I, I would just put in there that there are some, some agencies that are doing things um, really at light speed and really breaking down a lot of things. Uh, the U.S. Air Force has Platform One. Um, and if you're looking at Platform One, uh, you just Google that and, and you'll be able to see a complete DevOps, Agile, um, you know, initiative that's been set up. Um, they also have some agile uh, um, um, acquisition things that are going on there. You got USCIS, as he said, you know, 18F and digital, you know, the digital services, they're all sitting there hacking and being able to make this and paving the path for the rest of us. And so as we continue to combine our experiences, right, the acquisition world will be transformed in order to help us get more people quicker in order to flood the zone. Right. So here's a, here's a great question. Um, how do you try and coach and advocate when some of the manage, some of the leadership teams seem set on waterfall and uh, the related project management approaches? Who would like to jump in there? It's a brave soul. Is that, Che, are you volunteering over there? Oh, no, okay, Joanna's a volunteering. Go ahead, Joanna. Well, I'll go first and then Che can add. Um, so we have that. Um, we have, um, when I started, we had two distinct areas in our department. And I agree with, I don't recall who said it at the moment, but IT is the biggest challenge for us. Um, I've taught over 26 workshops, 27, I've lost count. Um, and some of my most difficult workshops were with all developers from our department that were the most resistant to change. Um, and some of their managers as well. So. I think in our department, we have fantastic executive leadership that supports us, um, but in our teams, like I said before, we had some grassroots teams when I started that I had helped build. Um, and everyone's always willing to jump in and start doing that. And then we kind of meet in the middle, right? And our middle managers are the ones that have the most um, issues with this because it, I think it treads the most on their purview, if you will, right? What are they going to do when their teams become empowered? What are they going to do when 
they don't need to check on these statuses every day, right? And the team's able to interact. I mean, I've had managers tell me, no, they're not allowed to talk to my customer. That's my job. No, what do you mean they're gonna call up the customer and ask them for a requirement? So that has been the biggest challenge for us. Um, but the way we've handled it, I mean, like I said, it's a journey and it's a, pro it's a process. We're, we're continually evolving. So I've stopped trying to kind of have these confrontations because, you know, there's that curve that there's 15% that are never going to do it no matter what. Um, so I try to focus on the ones that do, and we've tried to kind of showcase the ones that do. So in our meetings with executives, that's still important to a lot of teams and managers to have our CIO say, wow, that's great, and showcase them in there. So we showcase the ones, and eventually every team but one will be showcased. And so it's up to then that director, and we've also looked at their metrics to see are they going to be graded on how they're doing this? Because we have a lot of agile and name only, and I think that answers another question. So I'll try to do two and one really quick since I'm talking. So a lot of people say, oh, we do this. No, we do this. We already do this. We, we, do, we don't need you. We do this. Yeah, 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 we do that. We have all of our stuff in DevOps. And then I say, oh, well, let's put it here. And then they go, we don't have anything in DevOps. I don't have a container. And I said, you don't know what your own team has. And this was a conversation I actually had yesterday with the manager. So, there's a difference between doing and being, um, and it comes with time, I think. So that's, that's it. I think we have to showcase and again, support those that are doing it and trying and, and hopefully others will see the benefits as we move forward. Great, thank you. So Che, you can have the last word if you're really, really quick. Really, really quick. My throwaway line usually is, I use Nerf bats and squirt guns. No, uh, so um, just really, really quick. Uh, if it goes back to focusing on the need when uh, when people say I don't want to change uh, it really using a technique from uh, uh, Dr. Marshall Rosenberg's work in nonviolent communication uh, that that aggression no uh, really points to I'm scared too. So if I spend my time uh, trying to understand that executive or that manager's point of view, you know, what are you trying to do you think it's a good idea and you're afraid to try? Um, so it really, it really becomes more of a point of curiosity for me. Uh, and the, the quicker I can hone in on uh, somebody's need, uh, then we can find a solution together. Great. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, everybody. I also want to give a huge shout out to the attendees and lots of names I know on there. So great to see all those names. And Bill, it's back to you. All right, folks. Well, thank you. Thank you, Anne, for moderating today. And thank you to our panelists. Uh, fascinating discussion. Uh, Agile coaches on the front line. So uh, thank you so much for participating. And thank you to the audience today for, uh, for joining us. Uh, watch for the video to be posted online, agilegovleaders.org. And thanks to the AGL Live Working Group for helping to organize this as well, including Tim Nolan and uh, Dave Wickham, who are on the line. So thank you and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.